Recognition of autism and autism diagnoses have increased substantially in recent years, but physicians are often underprepared to provide routine medical care to autistic patients. This lack of preparation can have important effects on care quality and outcomes. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Lauren Schiff, an Associate Professor of OBGYN and a Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgeon at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Quality and Safety at UNC Hospitals. Dr. Schiff has co-authored a perspective article about providing effective medical care to autistic people. Dr. Schiff, I'd like to start with a question about language. Why do you and your colleagues use the term autistic person rather than person with autism? It's a really great question, and thank you so much for bringing it up. So there's been a lot of debate and continues to be debate at this time around how to name or how to call autistic or autism in people. This is because some people prefer what we call identity first language. And so for those people, they identify with their autism diagnosis and feel that it is not just a diagnosis, but it is who they are. And such similar to any other identity of race or religion, call themselves autistic people. There are others who feel more comfortable as autism being a diagnosis that they refer to. So person first language. So they are a person with autism. And this continues to be debated amongst people with autism, amongst researchers and clinicians, and there's no one right answer. The reason we chose to use identity first language is because large groups of autistic people do advocate for identity first language, and that is the more common expectation or reference currently. You say in your perspective article that because autism lies on a spectrum, autistic people have a wide range of skills and abilities. How might autism affect the way in which people engage with their clinicians or approach routine clinical encounters? Autistic people being on a spectrum have a wide variety of ways that they may interact with their clinicians or a healthcare environment, just like everyone else does. The things that we know to be true and are more common, again, not saying that there are significant differences between different people with autism, is that the environment where we expect patients to go through the steps of a system that we have established, going to a front desk, checking in, providing your name, talking to a stranger, being directed by yet another stranger into a clinic environment of unfamiliar location with unfamiliar tools asked to then step on a scale, which may be cold, it may be at a height that is uncomfortable, having a blood pressure cuff placed, which causes a squeeze of your arm that can be really uncomfortable and disconcerting to someone with any sensory difficulties. These are just some examples, even before you get to the office or the clinic room, where somebody who is experiencing difficulty in communication with new people, challenges with flexibility and being in new environments, that may cause overwhelm, fear, or anxiety, and having to communicate their needs in those moments, such as requesting not to have a blood pressure taken if they don't absolutely need it. Those are challenging moments. And like I said, before we get into the room to have a discussion about what their challenges might be, when we get to the room and are discussing their care and why they may be presenting, lots of people with autism or autistic people will communicate in different ways. Some prefer verbal communication. Some really struggle with verbal communication and much prefer to use written instructions or communicate in a written way. Maybe not like to speak directly to someone or have someone else speak for them. And using visual demonstration versus speaking may be a challenge as well. So these are just some examples and again, not exhaustive, but it becomes a very challenging and overwhelming environment the minute we set foot into a new space and we are not ready or prepared to help people in that space. What kinds of physical and mental health conditions are more common among autistic people than in the population as a whole? So our autistic population, interestingly, carries a higher likelihood of having morbidity and mortality from some common diseases that we see and treat in preventative care models. Some of those are GI illnesses, some are endocrine illnesses, and that also crosses over into mental health illnesses such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, OCD. But these all chronic conditions and things that experienced by all people are actually experienced at a higher rate in the autistic population. And so really 
expect or demand that we have a greater engagement with that population to prevent bad patient outcomes. You suggested a moment ago, and you actually say in your article, that most non-autistic physicians don't have the skills to effectively engage with autistic people. So why hasn't training in this area been more of a focus in medical education? I think that there are probably lots of areas where we haven't adequately focused in our medical education. And this one is particularly notable because of the significant prevalence of autism in our population. So one in 36 people have a diagnosis of autism. And you think about that even in your medical school class or amongst your colleagues in a department, you would certainly expect to have some people in that environment who are autistic. Yet it has been really under-recognized. And that is partially because for a long time, diagnosis of autism was under-recognized. And we're kind of in a boom era, so to speak, of increased recognition of autism, increased ability to diagnose autism, and increased awareness of the lacking services needed for people with autism. In fact, what are the implications of clinicians' lack of training and lack of comfort in treating autistic people? When we lack the training to engage with autistic people, many things can happen. First off, a patient may not even engage in coming to seek care because that person may have fears and experiences in the past that have been negative and so therefore don't even show up for things like preventative health care. In my field of gynecology, autistic women are much less likely to get preventative care such as pap smears. And this obviously increases our risk overall of their morbidity and mortality for cervical cancer. But beyond that initial fear or inability or challenge, however it is for that individual person to go and see their doctor, we, once we are in the clinic environment, tend to do things our own way. So what that translates into is challenges for autistic people to engage with the healthcare system. The fact that we are not aware of these challenges and cannot provide or do not provide accommodations that would make it easier for people to actually come into the office to actually be seen and get the care they need, they're less likely to get any of that care. The training that we don't receive in terms of recognizing changes or challenges or differences in how people interact may lead physicians to believe that their patient is non-compliant or non-adherent or that they aren't following instructions, or possibly if a patient, for instance, isn't making eye contact with you, the perception that the patient doesn't value your advice or isn't really engaged in their healthcare and aren't a partner in their healthcare. These assumptions and biases based on our neurotypical expectations for behavior really color our ability to care for our patients and provide them what they truly need. If we're able to identify and understand through training how an autistic person may present in the office, may need other supports or accommodations, then we're able to provide those and will unlock the ability for patients to truly engage in their healthcare and further not feel dismissed or disregarded, which is a very common experience for autistic people. So what steps can individual clinicians take to be better prepared to provide high quality care to autistic people? I think first is the importance of having curiosity and willing to be flexible. So this is, again, different for every autistic person. So there's not one prescription for what you do, for instance, when an autistic person comes to the office. But some things that can be helpful and upfront, the most important thing is to ask your patient if there are any accommodations that they would need or would like that would make their visit easier and allow them to engage in the visit more easily. So some of those things may be avoiding examinations or parts of the visit that aren't absolutely necessary. One of our common steps in a patient visiting an outpatient clinic is to obtain vital signs. And for someone who's autistic, this may be very invasive and challenging if they have sensory challenges with getting a blood pressure cuff taken or a thermometer placed in their mouth or standing on a scale. They may feel uncomfortable sitting exposed on an exam table and may much prefer to sit in the chair. Now, that's not necessarily uncommon amongst people in general, but an autistic person may have a much bigger challenge in expressing that discomfort and their discomfort in engaging in the expectations that you set forward may be higher. Some of the things that you want to think about are flexibility in changing what you may do during the visit to help that person. So some of those things are usually 
we often give long explanations verbally to patients about what we think is going on, what our steps or recommendations are for treatment. And if we're really on top of it that day, hopefully we'll write those instructions down. But most often we don't. And so some patients, while listening to you explain their problem, explain what you're seeing, explain what you think needs to be done, doing that verbally can be overwhelming. And the person may either not hear you fully, not be able to process the information, or even have overwhelm and kind of shut down and not be able to engage. So things to do to avoid that is one, to write things down. And pictures are very helpful, whether you want to draw them yourself or use tools that already exist to demonstrate what you're discussing is a very helpful assist. Some people feel very fearful about the process of the visit. So for a lot of autistic people, not knowing what comes next is very overwhelming and scary. So one of the ways we can mitigate that is by presenting a checklist, kind of an agenda of what the visit will look like. So the first thing we're going to do is talk and write that out with a checkbox next to it. The next thing we're going to do is an examination. Write that out and a checkbox next to it. And as you proceed through the clinic, you can mark off those steps so that the patient actually knows where they are and when they're close to the end. And that's a really important thing because for a lot of autistic people, transitions between activities can be challenging. So providing a beginning and an end that's visually apparent and that you can walk the patient through can be incredibly helpful. And again, those are just some examples, and every patient is going to be different and will benefit from different types of interventions. Finally, what about healthcare institutions and other medical organizations? What changes can be made on an institutional or policy level to improve care for this population? Well, I think first off, we have to recognize our major medical institutions, the prevalence of autism, the importance of caring for people who are autistic and the accommodations that we may need to put into place to make that possible and feasible. But secondarily, we need our institutions to expect and set standards for training. So training in medical students, training in residency, expectations for folks who practice or are already in practice for how we can do better. So standards given by the colleges of medicine to which they belong, of standards of care. These would be things that would be very demonstrable changes and demonstrate that our institutions recognize the need for change and the need for this education. And there are standards that we could easily attain if we devoted the time and the interest to doing it. Thank you, Dr. Schiff. 